Alrighty, if nothing else, if you want to follow with us, uh, we're going to turn to a few different places, but our uh, main place, uh, or the biggest place we'll be at is going to be Hebrews chapter 11. So find your spot in Hebrews 11, the 32nd verse is where we will start at when we eventually go over there. If we was going to title this message, I would simply entitle it Perseverance. Before we get started, we want to open up with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you today. Help us, God, to speak, Lord, the words that will be a, a help uh, and an encouragement to your people, God. Lord, we pray to give all glory to your Son above everything, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name, and amen. Uh, perseverance, we hope to encourage you today by discouraging you. Sounds a little, uh, sounds a little off there, don't it? But, you know, we... As we go along in this life, there are times that the Christian walk is not easy. It is difficult. It can be difficult spiritually, difficult mentally, maybe difficult physically. You get physically uh, hurt or tired or sick, whatever the case might be. And there are questions that arise in your mind. There are things that would seek to pull you away from God, seek to pull you out of God's house, seek to pull you away from faith. And there's, when those times come, you've got to persevere. You've got to continue to go through and keep your nose to the grind. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter and the 13th verse, <coughs> Jesus said, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That word endure means to persevere. And persevere simply, if, if I was going to give my own version of the, 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 what it means, it simply means don't give up. Don't stop. Um, this message kind of come to my mind. Um, you know, we, we all know that, that the Lord called Brother Jimmy home the other day, and I was on that call. And uh, uh, Tanya messaged me Friday night, and I appreciate that, asking me if I was okay. And uh, I, I was, and I appreciate her messaging me and asking me, you know, for whatever reason, maybe there's something wrong with me, um, calls have never bothered me. Um, I, I've never lost sleep over any EMS calls. Now, don't get me wrong, I've been sad, I've been angry, um, and, and, and all of that, and, and there's been some that I've rolled around in my mind, there's some that stay with me. I still remember the faces. I still remember everything that happened. But, but I've never really lost sleep over them. I've never really been super upset over any calls. And I got to thinking about that. And I've got, I, I thought about, and I even texted this to her. I, I said, you know, I, I said, for whatever reason, stuff like that don't bother me. But I said, I, I tell you what does bother me. What bothers me is, is when I see people walking away from God. Dusty's not here, but if she was here, you could ask her. I've lost sleep over seeing people slowly fade away from God. I've lost sleep. I've become physically sick over it. Listen, this road is not always an easy road to go on. But I thought about that, and, and what I thought about was this. The best things that you can achieve in life are those things that have a road of difficulty in front of you. We see Michael Jordan, for example, greatest basketball player of all time. And what we see is 50-point games, 60-point games. We see the multiple championships, the multiple scoring titles, the multiple MVPs, defensive player of the year, on and on and on we could go. But what we don't see behind that is the days that he was tired, that he still stayed in the gym and worked out. We don't see those days. We don't see the times that he was at physical therapy, getting his body taken care of where minor injuries and things were catching up to him. Kobe Bryant, the same thing. The story goes with Kobe Bryant that he used to get mad at his teammates because when the official Laker practice ended, most of them, if not all of them, will go home. Kobe stayed and worked out longer. And you know what it showed in his game? It showed in his game he had a level of ability about him that other players didn't have. And don't get me wrong. These men are, are God-gifted athletes. I'm not, I'm not denying the gift that God has given them. But they also worked at it. 
They spent the time there. They persevered through difficulty. They said in order to get to the place that I want to get, I am going to have to go over some difficulties sometimes. There's a video of Kobe Bryant. He went after a loose ball. And when he went, he fell down. His finger dislocated. The refs didn't see it. You can look this up on YouTube. He goes over to the Laker bench. The physical or the, or the trainer, the, the trainer gets up. The trainer grabs Kobe's head, puts Kobe's head on his shoulder, takes his hand, and you can see him shove his finger back in. Kobe goes back out on the court. There's some pain involved when you want the good stuff is what I'm getting at. If pain is involved in worldly accolades that will fade away, and all worldly accolades fade away. Years ago, you know, people talked about the NBA, they talked about Bill Russell. They talked about Wilt Chamberlain. They talked about those guys. Then it was Larry Burke and Magic Johnson. Then Michael Jordan. Now it's, then it was Kobe and now it's, it's LeBron. Accolades, achievements, all those things fade over time. But if those things that fade over time are worth going through difficulty and pain to get to, then how much more making it to heaven is worth all the pain that we will go through? How much more is looking on the face of the Savior and hearing Him say those words, Enter in, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many. You know what? I don't care about the last part personally, about me being ruler over many. I just want to see his face and hear him say, enter in, now good and faithful servant. That's really all I want to hear. And listen, I, I want to, to be uh, blunt. I don't want to be too discouraging, though. But sometimes we forget. It's amazing how humans are. When we're in a, a good place, we forget about the bad times. But then when we get in a bad place, we forget about the good times. We, we're, so, it, it, we're so fickle like that. Um, I want this message to be a reminder that when you get in the bad times, keep going through and don't give up. You see, faith is a two-sided thing. It's easy to have faith on the mountaintop. Faith is more difficult, though, when we're in the valley. But faith exercised in the valley brings about a character and a strength within us that is unmatched by the faith that is produced on the mountaintop. The kind of faith that we like is the kind of faith that's found in the book of Hebrews and the 11th chapter. I'm, I'm going to read what we all like, and, and I include myself in this. This is the kind of faith that fires us up and that gets us going. Hebrews 11:32. The writer says, "What shall I say more? Or what shall yes, what shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of uh, Jephthah and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life again. And we'll stop reading right there. That's the side of faith that we like. Myself, most very much included. We like when we feel victorious. We like it when we can plainly see God's hand at work. We like being on the mountain. You know, I, I use this scripture as, as an illustration uh, fairly often, but when Peter, James, John, and Jesus went up to the mountain and, and there Christ was transfigured before them, Peter said, Let, let's make some tabernacles here. This is a good place to be. And when I'm on the mountain, I give a resounding amen to Peter. The mountain is a good place to be. But Jesus said we have work to do. We have work to do. And so they had to leave the mountain. This is the kind of faith that we like. We, we like the dead being raised. We like victory. We like all of these things. But there's a flip side to this faith as well. 
after it says that women received their dead raised to life again, 36, 35th verse, the writer goes on to say this, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And listen to what the Lord has to say about these people, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. That's the side of faith that we don't want to go through, but yet it's vitally important. Sure. And God looks at these people and God says the world was not worthy of such people. Listen, there are so many things in this world, to and especially in this day and age, to discourage the Christian. I, I know people from other churches, and frankly, I know people from this very church who's been discouraged, who allowed the world to get in. They didn't persevere through temptation. They didn't persevere through the difficulty and, and fight through it. And they're not here. Where is their faith at? I don't know. But it saddens me. And, and I don't want to see it happen to anyone else. Sure. We, many times, what we get in our minds of Christianity is, and I don't know why this example comes to my mind. It's probably a poor example. But we, everybody's seen the Gaither homecoming shows, right? Everybody's seen them? We get that in our mind. That's what, that's what Christianity is. Sometimes, but not all the time. Sometimes it's a fight to keep your faith. Sometimes there's questions that get sown in your mind. And you have to fight through those questions and keep your faith. Sometimes the body is sick. Sometimes the body hurts. And you have to keep persevering through that and say, No, God loves me. I am going to trust in His love. I'm going to trust in His redemption. I am going to lean in Him when I don't understand. Sometimes it's the mind that gets sick. Sometimes it's spiritual. Sometimes it's financial. Whatever it is. There's all kinds of things that can come about to you to try to get you to give up and to quit. The Bible says... To be sober, be vigilant. For our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. He will come to you and tell you, just give up, just quit. Stop going. Stop going to church. You've sinned and you messed up, you might as well quit. Or look, look at what your mind's thinking. Look at what questions are in your mind. You, you might as well stop, just quit altogether. Look how long you've prayed for this healing and it hasn't come. So why don't you just quit? God isn't there. And it's at those moments that you must fight and persevere. It's at those moments you say, no, I am not going to give up. When I thought of this message, I've always been a huge boxing fan. And um, this is a sign I'm getting old because I feel like this about everything, sports and music. Uh, boxing isn't what it used to be. Um... The 80s and 90s, I, I felt, had so many great fighters throughout those years. Uh, there's some good fighters today, but not like it was years ago. But if, you're, if we have any boxing fans here, you'll probably remember this match. It was a pretty famous match in uh, 1994, November 5th. It was, I can remember stupid things that, that, that are of no value. I can. Um, Michael Moore. And George Foreman were fighting. Michael Moore was the heavyweight champion of the world. He was 25 years old. George Foreman, 45 years old, was the contender for the heavyweight title. I cannot remember if the fight was 10 rounds or the fight was 12 rounds. I, I do not remember. But Michael Moore was obviously a, a better physical specimen. Um, he was lighter. He was more muscular. Not taking anything away from Big, big George. George was a powerhouse, but he was lighter, he was muscular, he was younger, and he had who I feel training him, the, the person that was training him, I feel has the, the best boxing mind 
of all time, uh, Teddy Atlas. So Moore had all those things going for him, and the fight starts. And we get through the first nine rounds, and two judges have Moore winning seven of the last nine rounds. Uh, the other judge's scorecard didn't have it quite that far ahead, but Moore was still winning on his scorecard. In other words, um, we're over halfway through the fight. Uh, George isn't winning this fight. Michael Moore has beat him on the scorecards. Now, I don't know how many of you have watched boxing. Boxing, I feel like there's a lot of good metaphors for life out of boxing. And one of those metaphors, especially for the Christian life, is not giving up. If you've watched enough good boxing matches, you can tell when a fighter has been beaten mentally. You can see it in the way that they're carrying themselves in the ring. They're not doing as much offensively. And they're just looking to throw a big haymaker if they get the chance. They're, they're, they're getting a hit a lot more than what they're even, you can see it plainly. And when a fighter is beaten mentally, it's only a matter of time before the fighter is beaten physically. Nine rounds has went through. The tenth round starts. And Moore's ahead. Uh, Foreman's eyes are swollen. He, he's, been, he's been getting tagged. But he kept on keeping on. And in the tenth round... That one magic hit happened. Moore hit the canvas. And George Foreman was once again heavyweight champion of the world. Why I'm saying all that story is to say this. Don't give up when it gets difficult. Because victory is right around the corner. Don't stop coming to the house of God. Don't stop praying. You say, I don't, I don't feel like it. I understand. I understand that sometimes you don't feel like it. I understand sometimes you're not feeling it when you pray. I get that. Guess what? That is a part of it. It is a part of it. Sometimes you don't feel like coming to church. I get that. I understand that. But listen, if physically you're able to make it, come anyway. Listen, you're going to feel just as bad home spiritually as what you will in the house of God. It's better come to the house of God because you're more likely to be lifted up here. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't let the enemy pull you away. You say, well, preacher, I, I've messed up this week. I've had weeks where I've messed up. Don't quit. Come to the Lord. Tell Him your sins. Tell Him your problems. Lay Him down at your feet. And you say, well, then will all the problems go away immediately? No, you might have a little bit more suffering to go through. Uh, listen to what it, it says here. You see, God allows these things. God allows these things to prove us and to try us. Listen to what the Apostle Peter was instructed to write. We already read where Peter had wrote that our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Peter goes on to write these words in the ninth verse. That was the eighth verse of 1 Peter 5. This is the ninth verse. Speaking of Satan and everything that he will throw at you and the difficulties you will face. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Amen. Just keep your faith going even when you don't feel like it. A brighter day will shine, I promise you. Keep your faith going. Whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing, listen, you're going to feel like you're alone. When you feel like this, you're going to feel like you're alone. But listen, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Other Christians are going through it too. You know what we need to do as Christians? You know what we need to do as preachers? You know what we need to do as Sunday school teachers? We need to be more honest with each other about our difficulties. We need to let each other know that we all go through difficulties. Listen, I've been in churches, I've been in meetings, in conferences where you would think that the pastors, the preachers, or these Christians there, they never have a moment's problem to hear them talk. Listen, I'm going to tell you that's not real Christianity. You'll have problems. The Bible says resist him steadfast in the faith. Now listen to what else it says. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. So understand that first thought. God has called you unto his eternal glory. Amen. By Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. 
after that ye have suffered a while. Suffered, it says. There's some suffering that we go through along the way. After that ye have suffered a while, he says, he'll make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. He will do that for you. Listen, go through the fight and don't give up. One last scripture I'm going to turn to before we come to a close today. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 16. And, and here's where I want to also turn my attention towards you here today if you're lost. You've heard me talk about the difficulty of the Christian life. How that sometimes you're not going to feel it. How that sometimes it's going to be difficult. How that sometimes you have to fight. And you might say, well, preacher, then why would I even bother to fool with any of this? Because I promise you, knowing Him is the greatest thing you can ever do in this life. All of the difficulty, all of the struggle, all of the trial is He is worth it all. You will never find anyone like the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said these words, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Listen, he said take up his cross, your own cross. What does that mean? Well, the cross is an image of difficulty. The cross is an image of suffering. There will be some suffering along the way. You know, when Foreman saw Moore hit the canvas and the ref got to the 10 count and waved off the match, I bet he forgot about all them tags to the face he got in the first nine rounds. I bet he forgot about them. You know what? When Kobe Bryant received the championship ring, I bet he forgot about that time that trainer popped his finger back in place. Same with Michael Jordan. He forgot about all those long practices. All the sore muscles, all the aches, and all the pains. In the temporal, there will come a moment, there will come a time when you will forget about that. God will lift you up and make His presence known to you. But listen, even more so than that, even more so than that, there will come a time that in eternity we'll have forgotten all the difficulties of this life that we face. The Apostle Paul wrote, as Sister Mildred comes in the 8th chapter in the book of Romans. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now think about that for just a moment. <laughs> there are people out there who are suffering way worse than any of us here ever could imagine. There are people out there who have gotten saved and who have been saved that have went through unimaginable pain, unimaginable abuse, unimaginable problems in this life. And the Word of God says that when we get there, the things and the pain that we faced here will not even compare to the glory that God will give us one day. Keep on keeping on. Listen, if you're here today and you're lost, Jesus says, if any man will come after me. Listen, you've got a choice you've got to make for yourself. Will you come after him? Life's going to give you difficulties. It may give you more difficulties if you're saved. But listen, the end result is far better than anything this life can offer you, I promise, as we stand.